picking back up uh, S40 um, when we talked about it last week there was an urge to let's just vote um, and, and I think we could be about that point after 78 witnesses and, yeah. and discussion um, but because there has been it's been a little while since we actually looked at S40 thought it might be good to um, to have Damien uh, hit the high notes for us before we get into our final discussion. Ho hopefully our final discussion. Okay. Um, thank you for the record, Damien Leonard, Legislative Council. Uh, so S40 is up on the screen behind you, and I will walk you through it here. Uh, quickly, so on the first page, if we scroll down just a couple of lines, there we go. Uh, what you'll see here is the uh, minimum wage goes from the current rate, which is 1050, uh, up to a rate of $15 per hour by January 1, 2024. The increases start smaller at 60 cents a year and end up at 90 cents a year in the last year, so they kind of scale up as time goes on. Um, the next major change there, if we go to the bottom of page two, uh, this change here, if you remember Representative Wright's bill from earlier this session, uh, this bill uh, was added as an amendment in the Senate, and what it provides is that a tip is the sole property of the person that it's provided to or given to. Uh, so if you're a tipped employee and you receive a tip, uh, your employer is not allowed to pool that tip with non-tipped employees. The only exception to this is that if there's a tip pool set up between tipped employees, so all the servers pool their tips, or the servers pool their tips with the uh, bartenders or the hostess or something like that, um, and th that's considered a valid tip pool among tipped employees, that's still legal and that currently occurs. So basically what this is doing is preserving the status quo. And the reason for this is there is a recent federal rule change which has allowed tip pooling with non-tipped employees uh, provided that the employer pays the employees at least $7.25 an hour before tips. So. Um, so this basically maintains the status quo here. <coughs> Questions before I move on to the second section? Okay, the second section here, what this does is it provides that to the extent funds are appropriated, the Department for Children and Families uh, will essentially shift the sliding scale for benefits under the Child Care Financial Assistance Program uh, over to basically uh, compensate for any increase in the minimum wage. Uh, so for example, right now, as your wages increase, your amount of benefits goes down. And what this is saying is that if the minimum wage goes up by 60 cents, then the benefits, that slope shifts over correspondingly so that uh, folks who are on that down slope here, but whose wages would go up as a result of the minimum wage increase, will not see a, a hit on their benefits as a result of that minimum wage increase. This does not eliminate the downslope, uh, which would be um, more expensive to do. Um, so the benefits cliff phenomenon, which already exists, uh, and which you've heard some testimony about, is not going away. What this is doing is ensuring that the minimum wage increase won't exacerbate it. Sorry, I just want to be clear. This is, it says, to the extent funds are appropriated. Yes, so this is to the extent that the legislature appropriates funds to do this. And has the legislature appropriated funds to do this? Uh, at the moment, uh, it's been discussed with both appropriations committees. I do not know if it's in the big bill at this point or not. Um, so. Um, my understanding is that it this is. is love to find that out. Yeah, my understanding is that this is stopping in the appropriations committee after this, um, or likely to, since it affects the um, appropriations of the state. So, um, I guess. That's my expectations. Yeah. So, and I know when I testified there, they took testimony from myself, Joyce Manchester, Deb Brighton, um, and. Uh, 
uh, Reva Murphy and Ken Schatz from the Department for Children and Family Services on this issue. So they're certainly aware of that. Um, but at, at the moment, I'm not aware of the appropriation having been added. So. Um, the other thing that this would do is adjust the market rate based on so many child care workers are paid at or near the minimum wage. Uh, so the other thing that this is going to do is affect the cost of child care slightly as their wages go up. And so that the second part here is in addition to sliding that scale over, it's going to adjust the market rate to compensate for that. So we're not, uh, so that the, the subsidy basically purchases the same amount of child care. As you're, you probably remember, it doesn't pay for the full cost of child care because it's well behind the current market rate. Um, but what it will do is not be purchasing less uh, child care. So any other questions on that section? Okay. The third <coughs> section here, uh, this is just a report from Legislative Council and Joint Fiscal uh, to the members of the legislature, uh, well, to this committee and the Senate Committee on Economic Development. Uh, so for any of you who are still here in January of 2023, uh, I'll be submitting this report to you basically to identify mechanisms that other jurisdictions use to index their minimum wage to inflation um, and to identify and examine any alternative mechanisms for indexing the minimum wage uh, because this will be coming up on the year when we switch from the, uh, the set increases in the minimum wage back to indexing for inflation. Uh, and since this was adopted while well, most jurisdictions use the CPI, or actually all, there have been proposals to switch over to other measures of inflation that might be more accurate, like the chain CPI, uh, the PCE deflator, or um, the uh, tying it to the Social Security uh, rates or something like that. Um, other questions on that section? Okay, the last section here, section four, uh, the big change is on page five of the bill. Uh, the rest of it is just style cleanup, and this is just defining what a tip is. So a tip, uh, just to remind everyone, is a sum of money that's gratuitously and voluntarily left by a customer for service. This means that a mandatory service charge is not considered a tip for purposes of this bill, um, and that's consistent with existing law. So uh, when you see a mandatory service charge on your bill, the employer can use that to pay the wages of the employees. It doesn't have to be given as a tip. Uh, and that's something that will depend by employer. Um, many, of, many of the restaurants will simply say service charge rather than saying tip or something like that. So, questions? Okay, that's the underlying bill. Any questions for Daniel um, on the underlying bill? <coughs> Now, I've asked Damien to um, prepare an amendment for us to consider related to the student wage. Um, and um, I'm not quite sure what was wrong there you are. How, to, how to bring that up. You ready to have, do you want a question or just display it? Pardon? Do you want it posted or just display it? Why don't you display it or then you can post it to me. The posting is the immediate. Starting with the first struck out language there, if you can go down to the bottom of that language, Ron. There's just a minor change here. The old bill S40, uh, I forgot to update the uh, minimum wage language between 2017 and 2018 when it passed the Senate. So before it would say, an employer shall not pay any employee at a rate of less than $10. 
and then beginning on January 1, 2018, and then went on from there. But since January 1, 2018 is already in the past, it just says now an employer shall not employ any employee at a rate of less than 1050, which is the current minimum wage. So this was just, it's just a little cleanup so we don't have extra language in the statute. Um, the next change here, um, oh, the other thing to note is this is now subdivision A1. So before subsection A was all one big block, and I've broken it out because it gets complicated. Representative Sherman. Ron, can you put this onto the website too? Onto today's anyway? When Paul do so. What? I'm sorry. She asked if I could put it onto the website, and I said, well, I'm instructed to do so. Oh, yes. Yes, I said earlier that you could post that. Right. Most immediate thing that's getting up for us, and in case you couldn't well, I can't do things post. simultaneously. Thank you. Um, I can't easily. You can watch me do it, but I can't. You're on my computer right now, so that's, I can, that's I can fine. do it, but you'd be watching me do it. <laughs> Sausage making. Okay. Uh, so on page two, the next subdivision here. Go down. There we go. Perfect. So this would provide, so currently, uh, if you remember when we discussed the exceptions to the minimum wage, there's an exception to the minimum wage for students. Um, it's been a construed to apply to secondary school students and not uh, college or university students. And it's during all or part of the uh, school year and normal, vac normal vacation periods, which has also been construed to apply to times during the school year, but not the break between school years. So summer vacation is accepted. So we end up with a funny situation where students are at the federal minimum wage during the school year the state minimum which wage during the, which is 725 and the state minimum wage uh, during the summer which currently is 1050 um, so this would if that was left unchanged by the end by 2024 under this bill what you'd end up with assuming the federal government doesn't update their minimum wage in the meantime is students being at 725 minimum wage during the school year and then their wage doubling uh, every summer and then going back down in the fall when the school year resumes. So what this does um, is it provides that a secondary school student, and it clarifies that it's secondary school students, are, uh, cannot be employed at a rate of less than the minimum wage minus three dollars. So the standard minimum wage which currently is 1050, so they'd be at 750, although this wouldn't take effect until <coughs> January 1, 2019, so it would really be when the minimum wage is at 1110, the minimum wage for students would be 810, and it would stay in lockstep at three, $3 below year-round. Um, so. <coughs> so, <coughs> so that takes the seasonality out of it? It takes the seasonality out of it, yeah. And so for the first year, it would be, so, so if, if the minimum wage went up to 1110, it would just be 810. And <laughs> exactly. And just track it like that. So you just subtract $3 um, from year one and end out. And this is student. Secondary is, school student. Right. So, yeah, so it's. If you're still a secondary school student, then uh, you're covered by this provision. If you dropped out uh, or you've graduated, then you're no longer covered as a secondary school student. The only language that the committee might want to add in this case uh, if you decided to adopt this amendment, uh, currently the law says, you know, during all or any part of the regular school year, school year and regular vacation periods, you could add that and then add the language and during the break between school years um, to clarify that is, or you know, alternatively just say um, throughout the entire year or something like that. Um, but that may be making things more complicated by eliminating that specification during any part of the school year or regular vacation periods. You're basically applying it to secondary school students. So. 
Um, but that's just a, an alternative wording. I think this is simple and would do the trick. Um, so I just wanted to identify that since that had been, uh, I think, in the uh, bill introduced by Representative Briglin, we added the words and during the break between school years. Um, and that would have, just to bring you back to that bill, that would have just extended the exception to year round for secondary school students. Uh, are there questions on that addition? A change. Okay. The next change is at the very bottom of page, uh, or at the very top of page three. So uh, what this does is it strikes out the exception for students working during all or any part of the school year or regular vacation periods um, and just changes the uh, location of the and and the period in that section. Um, so this means that the students are now subject to the Vermont minimum wage provisions with that $3 um, below minimum wage requirement. Questions? So the other exemptions, uh, all of all of the A through H, are still in effect. Uh, it's A through I. Uh, yeah, A through H. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, yes, they're all all still in effect. And what? Uh, can you remind me what the agriculture, for example, why? Um, what their? Do they have a minimum wage? Um, so agriculture is kind of an interesting one. Um, some agricultural workers are subject to the federal minimum wage under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, so uh, to the extent that they do, it's $7.25 an hour. There are various um, provisions for peace rates and so forth. Um, and Fair Labor Standards Act has a, a pretty complicated regime when it comes to agriculture, including uh, provisions around like um, uh, child labor and so forth related to that, but if you'd like, I can pull up the the agriculture language from the FLSA for you. I just figure if we're doing a minimum wage increase, that these um, exemptions are are things we should address. There's a lot of them. Yes. So. Um, so this, meanwhile, we're putting a large burden on our retailers and others who are competing against a pretty significant market, but um, all of these other things, domestic service, agriculture. Yeah, so many of these reflect... Newspaper deliveries. Many of them reflect what's in the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, sure. So, uh, and, and that's been where they've, where they've been at. The Fair Labor Standards Act uh, has an exemption instead of, instead of Students, a student exemption, the Fair Labor Standard Act applies a, has a training wage provision for individuals under 20 years of age, so it no longer has the student exemption. Um, so to the extent that that would be uh, consistent, um, that's there, although this wouldn't provide that 90-day training wage, it just provides a lower minimum wage for, um, for those students, which is an approach that some other states have taken. But other questions on that? The um, the oh yeah, just on the student portion of it. Um, later on in the labor statute, there's discussions of how fourteen-year-olds or sixteen-year-olds, eighteen-year-olds would be employed. Um, when you write secondary, does that include, I mean, 14-year-olds can be hired for limited kind yes. of work, right? yes. and is that an age that's considered secondary? Uh, yeah, so secondary school is considered through high school. Um, Just through high school? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, by the, this doesn't change the, the child labor restrictions in terms of um, for individuals under 18, uh, restrictions on preventing them from being employed, for example, in dangerous occupations and restricting the hours that they can work uh, and so forth. Um, so this doesn't change any of that. All this does is it affects the minimum wage for them. So that, 
as an employer, you'll still have to comply with all of the same child labor standards under our state wage laws and the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, and the only thing this is going to change is you'll have a consistent year-round minimum wage uh, for those students. Um, and that wage will uh, be increasing, um, you know, at a uh, three dollar <coughs> step below what the standard minimum wage is if this this were added. <coughs> okay. So the last. Are there discussions on this? Oh, oh, there's another piece. Yeah, they, mm -hmm. it's just the effective dates. So what this provides, it's a pretty complicated effective date, but basically what it provides is all the amendments necessary to do the student wage piece take effect on January 1, 2019. Everything else takes effect on this coming July 1st. The reason for that is so that the student wage matches up with the next change in the minimum wage, uh, so you don't have a mid-year change for employers. In this case, it would be a mid-summer change for employers where the wage would suddenly drop. Um, and so this, this just means that they can kind of plan and on January 1st those wages change. No further questions on this suggested amendment? Discussion? Laptop under iPads now. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Huh? So that's Certainly would eliminate confusion um, that that seems to exist now mm -hmm. in employers about the different times of the school year. Um, create some clarity. some ability to, to move this. Of course, the federal minimum wage has been frozen for how many years? I can't remember uh, off the top of my head in the mid-2000s. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and unlike some of the other exemptions, we did take testimony from the department and, and, and Representative Brickland about, about this issue. I wonder how much it will encourage uh, employers to hire high school students rather than rather than others who might need jobs. That's an interesting question. We know that they're the minority of, er of uh, low wage earners at this point, based on the reports we received. Representative Smith, I think you're probably going to see uh, a lot of small business um, uh, employers releasing some of their full-time people, like Heidi said, uh, picking up uh, part-time help and paying them as little as possible because it's going to put a, a lot of the small-time, small businesses out of business eventually. Uh, this happens, so I think you're going to see a lot of part-timers. Just from the other side of the ledger, um, I don't think there's been any show that that would happen. I mean, we've been asked to clarify, simply to clarify how people can hire youth, and that's that's been a question for the last five years. And this, I think, this is a minimum wage. It's not the only wage. You know, it's, it could be an entry wage. We only took testimony from one or two people that mentioned that they used the student wage. Um, we asked the chambers, and no one knew of anybody who used this wage, but it's the market. You know, if Shaw's wants to hire people at 8, 10 an hour and they can't fill it, then they're going to start paying people more, I think, in the long run. I'm not sure it's going to displace anybody. Um, that hasn't been shown to be the case in any, in, in any situation now because people people have been able to charge or to pay less for time immemorial and they haven't so I'm pretty comfortable with that. May I rebut? 
<laughs> pleasantly rebut. Uh, like existing employer employees in a in a retail store or whatever that are right now maybe making thirteen dollars an hour or something like that. If the minimum wage raises, these people aren't going to be happy with someone coming up to their pay level. Uh, when they've been there five, six, or seven years, they're going to want three or four dollars an hour more as well, which probably could lead them to look for another job or, or just gripe and complain until they're either fired or they quit. I don't know if that to be a fact or not, but I think there's a trickle process here that might, might be a problem down the road. You can rebut. Man, <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> and again, and again, you know, wage compression is something that we we talk about, and you know, we don't have we don't have any factual knowledge of it happening. Um, we've asked for facts and figures and stats, and um, we haven't seen it happen over the last five years. In fact, the economy has been. The economy's been as stable as it ever has been. I mean, we're not happy with the level of jobs and the number of people who are making minimum wage. Um, but I think we've seen that the economy has not been damaged by raising people's wages at the lowest ends of the scale. And I think that would still apply. <clears throat> Representative Howard, I just want to add um, a single mother with children who works two jobs may be able to work one job, which would open up another job for someone else. Um, I just can't see someone working at a minimum, at, at a $10.50 an hour to try and support their family. It, it just seems impossible to me. Um, I would say that people making the minimum wage are not our most vulnerable because they have multiple paths out. There's already a built-in inflator every year annually tied to the CPI. They can get a raise. It's an employee's market right now at one point whatever percent. They can go work for somebody else. There are ways out of it. The people that this hurt, never mind the businesses, which I've been spouting about for three weeks, but nobody wants to listen, are seniors. We have heard multiple testimony that in-home in care is going to be diminished because a lot of those people make minimum wage, so they'll have to cut back on services, and Medic mm -hmm. Medicare will not be able to go with it, so there'll be fewer services. These are our most vulnerable. Then we have our seniors who are coaching. Listen. It, then we have our seniors who are barely getting by. And we are going to raise how much it costs for them to live. Because prices are going to go up. I mean, you, you can't, an employer can't just absorb this. Actually, I shouldn't say that. Costco, every your box store, they can absorb it. Small businesses cannot absorb it. We have got to look at the reality of this, and we are not. We're trying to save the world, and in, mean, in doing it, we are putting our most vulnerable at risk. And it would be unconscionable for us to pass this. Unconscionable. I will not go up to a senior who says, you just made it more expensive for me. Why? Well, I don't know, because we wanted to have a minimum wage employee ha have, who's already entitled to a wage annually, a raise, or can do something about it. We found that them to be more vulnerable than you. Sorry about that. It's unconscionable. I've just about had it with this whole bill. And it's not, a, it's not about market. Because if it was about market, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. We're not letting the market do its thing. I'm done. I've got an easy, I've got an easy question, Madam Chair. Uh, if this bill passes and the minimum wage increases yearly, is there also going to be a cost of living increase that goes along regardless of what the minimum wage is? At the end of 2024, then it is tied into it. That's how it reads. 
So there's not going to be any cost of living increases between now and 2024. Are there clear step increases between now and 2024, which Damien reviewed in the beginning? Do you mean in, in, in the increases in the wage or increases no, in benefits? Okay, in, in, in the Social wages, Security, well, for example. Like we, we have, we have uh, employees in our town garage that are getting a wage. Now, say this minimum wage didn't happen. They're going to get a two and a half or three percent increase every year. That's what we do uh, for our town employees. Now, if the minimum wage also goes up every year, are we going to have to give them a two and a half or three percent increase as well? Do you know what I mean? No. No, they're part yeah, of this doesn't affect what a private employer has right. to do with their employees, you know, whether it's the town or the state or whether anyone like that. Whether an additional raise or not. Well, only if they'd already be underneath the minimum wage right. and they'd have to come up. Yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll have to come up to the minimum wage, but beyond that, it's up to the employer to decide what if I guess I'm confused. I'll, I'll forget I even said that. Okay. I'm just confusing myself more. It, it seems that a number of us are ready to move to the underlying bill and and, um, and and get that vote underway, but I wonder if we might weigh in first on the proposal uh, related to the, the, the um, student wage. Starting with a uh, hand count. Those who are in favor? Those opposed to the student wage change? I want to think about it more. Yeah, I kind of want to as well. <laughs> I would have done some, I didn't realize this was coming, so I would have done some, some talking to folks. Um, is that something you're willing to do today? Mm -hmm. Um, because barring other issues, I would like us to, to come to a final conclusion today. Continuing discussion on the underlying bill? Anybody who hasn't spoken yet first? Um, so, I mean, I've, I've already, I'm not going to get into my, I've been very clear about my position on this bill, but, um, uh, but I'd also like to reiterate the importance of, um, of decoupling the tipped minimum from the minimum wage if we're going to move forward on this. So. Is that on so that, that would be decoupling and, and essentially doing what to? Leave it as a, as a, as a, as an increase on, in the cola of it, you can keep it at 5.25, and then it would be a cola. In, wh what we have now, in place. yeah. So a CPI increase CPI, on 5.25. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing. Yeah. So. Okay. so on that, I just want to reiterate um, my position of holding, at, at least holding, the tip minimum wage to the 50 percent. Uh, we heard testimony on how when we have a less percentage of our tip minimum wage to our minimum wage, then we have increased harassment in the workplace. And so it's a really important for me to at least hold that. Very quickly and briefly, I support the bill as written and the amendment. Not addressing this. Not addressing the, the tip in the wage. Any right. differently than that. As written, as the bill, bill as written. As written. The tipped wage is an interesting issue, and I know that we've heard um, uh, testimony for um, both what Heidi's advocated for as well as, as, as Deanna. Um, and um, it's, it's been a, a little bit of a perplexing one for me to think about getting to it. I had heard even before we began the discussion of, 
of congressional activity to try and eliminate the, the tipped wage, um, sponsored by both Leahy and Sanders. Um, and in my mind, that's probably the, the, the fairest long-term strategy. I, I remember hearing from Lisa Senecal early on about the uh, harassment she had, um, she experienced in her job. Um, others have. Uh, we have had testimony on this issue in the committee in the past. Um, although it's always been easier to get tips employees to tell me on the side of what their um, experiences have been rather than to, um, to come out uh, on the record, and, and that's understandable um, in many ways. And, um, uh, but I think it's, while I would like to, to eventually see the tipped wage eliminated, um, I don't know that it's realistic for our for our um, employer community to experience that at this point. Um, but I do would not want to see a rollback of of um, of uh, what we provide at present. Personally, the fifty percent. Um, anybody who hasn't spoken yet first, and then. And then those of us who have. Uh, right. So I, you know, just I think everybody knows it, but I feel the same way. I'd like to, I hope this country eventually eliminates the tipped minimum wage, but at this point I would not support rolling back on it, and I support. Um, the bill with, and also the amendment for the student wage. Anybody else on this? small businesses in the state of Vermont uh, and I support senior citizens in the state of Vermont and anybody that votes against or votes in favor of this bill I don't feel does support that that's just my opinion so. <coughs> I can feel my head turning right I okay, let's really just, let's just take a moment I am offended by that I'm sorry I am offended because I have many senior citizens in my district. I have many, many families in my district, many single parent families. I know what it's like to run a business. We have had two businesses. I don't have millionaires living in my district. And any time I can help my constituents who sent me here to represent them, I'm going to do so. I s truly support this bill and this amendment, and I hope that um, this bill passes. Thank you. Tommy. I am a senior citizen, so I feel obliged to speak up. I am not too. that old. I am too. A little bit older than you. I've been here a little longer than you have. Yes, you have. And a I, lot longer. And I think this is going to. Oh, okay. I think this is going to benefit uh, our economy as a whole, and I think this is a matter of a rising tide that truly will float all boats. That's one reason why I'm in favor of this bill. Um, I guess uh, I've been quiet for a while. I guess, you know, the system's been broken. You know, you, we look at the data that we've received. We look at the problems that we've heard about. 
the system has been broken. We have an opportunity to at least change the direction a little bit. What we did as a legislature by moving the support staffs of the dedicated agencies up to $14 an hour protects that vulnerable population of seniors because they are already covered in that in that group. When we saw the information from Mrs. Manchester that she shared with us from Eris, the 8,000 plus employees that are working in that you know, entity will not be affected adversely by this change. If anything, it will help that group. And they're the ones that actually are supporting all of those folks that we're talking about in that senior care venue. Explain that. No, were you, were you here that? Yeah, it was also there when she day. showed everything about a job loss of 2,250 people and a drop in the GDP of 0.3% from this. That's the same economist. So you can't cherry pick what she says. No, no, it isn't a question of, you know, of, of cherry picking. You know, there, there is still, you know, the fact that those people are being, you know, covered. Those funds we allocated in our budgets, you know, for, you know, the increase. And I'm not sure, you know, like how much they've disaggregated that number yet to find out what the effect of that's going to be. But based on the general information that we've received, you know, I personally feel that we're going to be okay over time. Okay, it's, it's just like, you know, in businesses, and I run businesses myself too. I've had them, you know, and I started them probably earlier than most people in this room. And I get that, you know, that question about the viability of the business. But one thing I do know about that is, is that if you do a good job and you provide a good service and you build a customer base, they will come and they will continue to come. And that's what grows a good business. And you know that yourself. Right. You know? So you, are you saying let the business owner run his business, his or her business? Yes. Without being told what to do? No, no, this isn't telling what to do. We, we, have, we have not done our job, you know, as government in moving that needle what, since 68, the, the last piece that, that we saw was since 68, there was that, that chart where the line just, everything was moving consistently, and then we stopped changing or adding, you know, two, and the lines just went into like alligator mouths. You know, they split very drastically. And that's what we're working on, you know, like now for that, that period of time, there has been no growth, you know, whatsoever, you know, <clears throat> across the, you know, the board, and and that's not fair, you know. We're trying to bring some fairness back to this equation. Okay, you know? I, I, I sense once again that, every, that, that members of the committee are are wanting to talk about and mostly move toward some final resolution on the okay. bill, and uh, I want to get a. Uh, an indication of where people are if there is a, a specific proposal related to the tipped wage. And let me frame that the way I think I'm hearing it, and, and Heidi help me. Um, but your proposal would be to um, uh, so we decouple, decouple the, the tipped tip wage, wage we live at 525, and that it increases annually uh, by CPI. Okay. Not within my proposal. And I guess I could move that if somebody would second it. Just a question. Yeah, and just to be clear, Heidi, that, that would still leave in the obligation to get them to the minimum wage. It wouldn't change that. That's right. Thank you. We move away from the, the, the current requirement that um, the employer pay 50%. 
Can I see a show of hands well, at this point? Well, how, how, those who well, how does it change? I mean, how mechanically? Does I haven't. Work? I don't have it drafted up. If, if it's not going to go anywhere, I'm just. I'm not going to have it oh, drafted okay. up. So this is just but, a straw poll, you mean? It's a straw poll at this point. I don't, yes. I don't fully totally understand what you're saying. You don't fully understand don't. what Heidi's proposing. No, I don't. Okay. Or what's the right, benefits? So the benefits. Right now, let's have Damien remind us of what the the, the status sure. quo is. Ron, can you pull up the the amendment, please? Or whoever's got it, looked up. Um, so just uh, briefly, the status quo is: if you're a tipped employee, your employer has to pay you a base wage equal to one half the minimum wage rate. And then the assumption is you're going to get tips to fill up that other one half, uh, and ideally you'll get more than that. Yeah. But in the in event that at the end of the week, uh, the amount of tips you get and the amount of base wage you get doesn't equal the minimum wage for the hours you worked, your employer fills in the gap and covers the difference. That's the way it is right now. That's the way it is right now. Okay. What Representative Sherman is proposing, uh, currently the tipped wage is $5.25. So what this would do, if we look at uh, number three here, line 13, where it says uh, less than one half the minimum wage, mm. that would change, one half the minimum wage would be struck, and it would say uh, $5.25. And then after that, it would say beginning on January 1, 2019, and on each January 1 thereafter, the basic wage rate shall increase by the, uh, it, would, it would be by the percentage increase in the CPI and in no event shall it de decrease if it's gonna track our current minimum wage. So basically, you're looking at probably between two and 3% increase year after year, depending on inflation. Does that, does that do it? Yep. I just Vicky. want to, could Heidi explain the benefit, what's the reasoning of benefits of that for the worker? Yeah, because, um, well, uh, so, you know, number one, this is the minimum wage. They have to meet the minimum wage, regardless of what their minimum wage is. It could be $30, could be $15, whatever our minimum wage is, the employer has to meet that if they don't get it in tips. So the minimum wage is taken care of, regardless. Um, how it benefits the worker is that, you know, when they, if you increase it by 50, if you, in, if you keep it at 50%, um, uh, are, the restaurants are already taking the increase on the, in the back of the house, in their management. You increase it by 50%, it could um, put them, for example, because then all costs go up. Mm -hmm. They'll get a higher, t tips are based on, on uh, the cost of the, the dinner or the meal, right? Basically, twenty percent, fifteen percent of the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. so they get even that much more in tips. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times, you'll end up uh, with servers who are making more than managers of the thing. So, um, in general, you know, you're you're talking about we're talking about a minimum wage bill here. We're talking about minimum wage. Um, these are generally uh, healthy wages. Um, you're. In, in, in general, tipped, and I would say all of the people who want to get rid of tipped, uh, tipped of the tipped minimum, um, that is going to, um, that would have an incredible impact on a pretty healthy economy, uh, industry, which is our restaurant industry. Um, and I don't think you will be able to find, um, I mean, just now you talk to servers or bartenders, and I have yet to find one who would rather work for $15 an hour than tips. Um, I, 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 I have yet to find one, um, and that is in my community and it's elsewhere, I've, I've asked. Um, and um, so I think one of the worries is that you're, you're really changing the dynamic of, of, of the industry right now. Um, they're, you know, they'll go to counter service, some other things, right. some other options or options out there for them instead of having those tipped and employees. And keeps the prices down that mm -hmm. of the food. Uh, yeah, I mean, it won't increase them as much. I mean, they're still gonna, any, anybody that's doing, you know, farm, you know, local, local foods and what have you is gonna, I mean, anything is gonna increase the cost, but I think when you talk to restaurant owners, you're, you're dealing with a, pr a pretty healthy um, wage uh, that you're already talking about, and, um, and when we're talking about minimum wage, we, we put that into consideration, so. And I, again, I think the, the 
um, the concern for restaurant owners is that we'll end up moving, you know, they'll end up moving to more counter service, fewer, um, fewer uh, servers, uh, and what have you. So overall, reducing the number of employees. As I understand that no one has proposed eliminating tips. Um, some restaurants in other places, I don't know of any in Vermont, have done so. Um, I don't know what their effect has been. I know other states have eliminated the tipped wage. The propo while there has been discussion of eliminating the tipped wage, I don't know that that's a proposal on the table right now. It seems as though what we're talking about is what Heidi has proposed, um, essentially the uh, decoupling and the CPI on the tipped or the stat or the status quo of what we do now, which was passed by the Senate in S40, which is um, the tips remaining 50% uh, of the regular minimum wage going forward. Mm. Tom? Yeah, I share the same constituents as, as Representative Sherman on this issue, and it's been very um, instructive to hear their economic development issues with, with the tip minimum wage, and, and it's very compelling to me. What I'm finding, though, just the fact that people had to ask what it meant and what the plan was, to me, tells me that it would be really difficult to vote for it today, just as it would be difficult to vote for getting rid of the tip minimum wage altogether in terms of not getting enough testimony. I mean, I've, I've heard from my restaurant owners pretty deeply, and I understand what they're talking about. Um, and personally, I also am <laughs> very, you know, the, the idea of discrimination and harassment that happens in restaurants is very close to, to, to who I am and where, where I've been in my world. And so, you know, at this point, I would, if there's time, and I don't know if it's an amendment, you know, this, I hate to bring up the idea of another study, but if you look at the whole minimum wage or the wage section in that we're dealing with, we're dealing with a small portion of it. There are elements in here dealing that follow this that deal with time and a half. Um, we've heard, well, people can work 50 hours and get time and a half on that. It's like, well, these jobs don't get time and a half. There's a, there's a whole list of jobs that are not eligible for time and a half. Um, this idea of what should happen with the tip wage, we don't know anything more than tip workers for sure, except for restaurant workers. Um, though we think that there are tip wage workers elsewhere in the in the economy, and you know, I I would just I mean again I on, on my left hand I don't want to bring up another study, but on the other hand, there's a lot in this statute that's dated. There's things like wage orders, which we haven't done for forever. Um, you know, there's a lot of language, not unlike, so I'm putting on my Title VII hat, like I did about wanting to see the Title VII rewritten. There's elements in here that I think we should visit because, you know, even the exemptions that we that are in there, we don't understand. We haven't taken enough testimony to understand well, what does it mean to give an exemption to a nanny or the agricultural worker. Um, so, I mean, if I had to come down on it, if I had to come down on either side of the fence that I'm sitting on, you know, I would, I would, I would say I would support status quo right now, but push to have a serious study done on what the ramifications of um, social and, 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 and economic development-wise, what the effect of changing the tip minimum wage would be, as well as the other aspects of, of, the, of the statute that we haven't touched. We haven't touched them, as far as I can tell in quite some time based on the changes that have been made. So I, um, I'll throw that out there, but in the very least, I would like, you know, I'm, I'm going to lean towards status quo for now and then work on, try to work on fixing what the tip minimum wage should be. Everybody clear right now about what Heidi's proposing? Yeah. show of hands of those who are in favor of what Heidi's proposing. Opposed?
um, other ideas? Are other are there other amendments out there? <laughs> So um, it sounds as though folks may need a few minutes to explore the student wage, to huddle and think about that. Uh, 20 minutes do it. Okay, so we'll come back at, at uh, 225. members to sign or just our committee? Do you know? I got it from Tommy. <laughs> Tommy, do you know? Ron would probably know. All right. Because if it's everybody, if it's everybody, I'm just going to put my name at this point. Because we need to be alive. I'm on the floor and then I couldn't find it. I need to have it redone if that's the case. Ron will know. What? No, just just our committee. Every committee has one. Okay, great. So take as much space as you want. Okay, great. <laughs> Important <laughs> distinction. Okay. Um, okay, sure. Okay. Back on the record. Who are we missing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, so. Um, we come back to the student wage proposal. Any any further discussion about that? Thanks for having, thanks for uh, giving me the time. Um, I was trying to figure out where this remember kind of where that whole thing came from and uh, what was what the issues were expressed and um, and um, while we heard a lot from people about tips minimum and seasonal workers. I think the only one that I recall anyway is from Representative Brigland with regard to the student thing. So um, I don't, from what I understand, not many people use this, uh, not many businesses use it, so um, so I appreciate it, but I'm not gonna, I don't think it needs to be uh, added to the bill, but. Anybody else? I wonder if we could have a motion um, in support of the student wage. And so moved. Second. So it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, clerk, would you kindly call the roll? This is on your. This is on. This the is on the. This student. is on the amendment. The student amendment, three dollars year round, three dollars right. less than the regular minimum wage. <coughs> Consistent year round. Okay, so this is actually on the amendment. So this is not on the underlying bill. This okay. is just one point. But they are. So this is just one point. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Representative Stevens. Yes. Representative Gonzalez. Yes. Representative okay. Reed. No. Representative Walls. Yes. Representative Strong. No. Uh, Representative Christie. Yes. Representative Fields. Yes. Representative Sherman. No. Representative Howard votes yes. <clears throat> Representative Smith. No. And Representative Head. Yes. 
been said, but I'll open it up in case it hasn't all been said. Uh, I'll go ahead and make a motion um, to accept the test for you as amended. Yep. To concur with the Senate with further proposal of amendment. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Heidi? Uh, I will just... Um, say that I think we are doing an incredible disservice to Vermont uh, employers, small employers, and employees. I think the women, I know we've been talking a lot about women, but the women I'm, I'm looking at are also uh, people like um, Sarah DeFelice, who has started a business, is working um, on ensuring that business is success, and she's going to have to close three days a week, and possibly, probably, eventually. Um, forever. I, I think about Caleb, May, uh, Caleb Magoon, who is a local uh, guy in Lamoille County who's invested a lot. And again, these are just the kind of young entrepreneurs we want. And um, and um, want them to grow their business, want them to invest in further businesses, in more businesses, grow their wages organically um, if the market, uh, which they are doing. Um, but um, uh, But what we're putting into place will make it exceptionally difficult for many of our small businesses and the employees of that small business, those small businesses. So um, I think we're doing an incredible disservice. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I go to the Vermont uh, Retail Gross Association. I've listened to the Vermont Department of Labor and I've listened to a small little store in the corner of the Northeast Kingdom. I've listened to big, right down to the little tiny four employer, four employees. And that's why those three decisions made me, those three witnesses have made me decide how I'm going to vote on this. We've heard from a variety of witnesses within our total of 78. Um, and there have been a lot of compelling stories that we've heard. And I've certainly been moved by um, uh, both employers and workers alike and those who represent uh, disadvantaged populations all arguing for a, not all, but many, arguing for a gradual increase in the minimum wage. Um, and I certainly believe, um, based on the work that we did with the study committee in the fall and the work our committee has done, that $15 by 2024 um, will strengthen um, our wage base and um, and be a productive move for them. If there's nobody else, um, when you're ready, Mary. Okay. Representative Stevens. Yes. Representative Gonzalez? Yes. Representative Reed? No. Representative Waltz? Yes. Representative Strong? No. Representative Christie? Yes. Representative Fields? Yes. Representative Sherman? No. Representative Howard <laughs> votes yes. Representative Smith? No. Representative Hett? Yes. Okay. 
Thank you all. Madam Chair, just to let you know, I, um, I'm just going to be clear to the committee that this might, if this comes to the floor, this might be something I speak on on the floor. And just so you all know, I've already told the chair, Madam Chair, that I definitely will if it gets to the floor. I probably will as well. While I appreciate your letting me know, I find that disappointing. There's been a long-standing um, tradition of committee members uh, either supporting their committee or, or remaining silent on the floor when they cannot do so. So that's disappointing. I still am going to take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. With all due respect, I'm here for my constituents, not for anybody's party or for protocol. And I understand that, but you know, this this is important. So, well, I trust that we can go on to work together on important things for the for the rest of the year, um, based on our mutual respect and support for one another. We've done some great work this year, and I think we have um, the possibility of doing more as our, our bills come back from the Senate. So I thank you all for that. May I make, the, make a suggestion? Mm -hmm. Any other bills that we vote on? Why would you and Ed just arm wrestle over it? <laughs> Okay, so um, I, we're back on the floor at 3, and we're back in committee next uh, at 9 in the morning, is that right? Yes, we're 9 in the morning. We've got more twists and turns with um, uh, short-term rental. That's at 9. Oh, oh wait. Oh, wait. We're we so we in at 9. Update, not naming at 9, just updating what's happening in the Senate okay. with our bills, and then short-term rental at 9.45. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you.